and welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm going to be doing my August reading wrap up and I'm filming this on the 24th of September. So I'm also going to throw in the two books I've read so far in September because I won't have read that many books at the end of the month anyway. So yeah, I'll add those two books and the two other books I might finish by the end of the month. I'll throw in my October reading wrap up. So yeah, it's gonna be a bit weird, a bit different, but um, unfortunately, just like last year, well, <laughs> I'm thinking of September. September was a terrible month mental health wise, which is why I'm only doing my August reading wrap up now. Also, bonus this time, since I went to London and then Wiltshire from the 1st to the 5th of September, I'm going to throw in a book haul as well because I <laughs> seized the opportunity of going to English language bookstores and uh, I was just like, take my money! <laughs> So the one book of nonfiction I read in August was a book titled 22 Things a Woman with Asperger Syndrome Wants Her Partner to Know. So it's a fairly short kind of self-help book for women on the spectrum who want to explain to their partners what it's like being autistic, basically, or I mean, you know, the subtype Asperger's syndrome within autism. It was okay. I mean, it was decent. I guess what I took away from this book was basically an explanation of autistic traits and traits I relate to that I hadn't seen discussed in other books I've read on the subject. So that was neat for myself with regards to helping one's couple. I would say it's filled with pretty standard advice, you know, talk to one another, establish clear non violent communication, be patient, be willing to compromise. I mean, it's all, yeah, pretty basic self-help for couples 101 stuff. So that was fine. I really mostly appreciate this book for, like I said, the autistic traits I saw discussed, but I hadn't seen discussed as much in other publications. So, I mean, yeah, I would recommend it if you are a woman on the spectrum and you've been newly diagnosed or you're questioning whether or not you're on the spectrum. You could do worse with this one. I guess you could also technically give it to a partner or even a friend or a family member to explain those autistic traits. But I mean, if you're having <laughs> marital troubles or relationship troubles, it's pretty basic stuff. Not bad. The basic. So moving on to the meat of the video, which will be fiction. So the first book I finished in August was Hummingbird Salamander, written by Jeff Vandermeer. This is Jeff Vandermeer's latest novel. I'm pretty sure it came out. I can't remember exactly when, but presumably, I think it was a year ago, something like that. I thoroughly enjoyed this book. I did a full length video review for this one if you want to check it out. It's basically a kind of thriller with a smidgen of science fiction to it kind of, I call it pre-apocalyptic fiction. There is strong theming centered on ecological conservation, destruction of the environment, human beings' relationship to the wider natural world, etc, etc. There is a very strongly defined, as I'm going to call it, main female character. I didn't particularly relate to her, but I found her interesting. And more generally, I tend to find Jeff Vandermeer's female characters quite interesting. And his male characters, but my point is <laughs> he does interesting characters in general, including female ones. So yay. At first, I didn't think I was going to get that much out of it, but just like with Under the Skin, written by Michelle Faber, I just got hit with a wave of theming and a wave of emotionality towards the end of the book, and by the end I was just mildly blown away. I was very moved and shed quite a few tears <laughs> at the end of this also. There's a little tear running down from the hummingbird's eye, and I, I keep thinking how apt that is. It's a brilliant cover. I mean, I love this cover. I think it's beautiful, but it's also indicative of what's inside in a very special way. If you know, you know. So I would definitely recommend this one if, well, you're a Jeff Vandermeer fiction fan, obviously, and if you like thrillers, with an element of light science fiction and an interesting main character and theming around ecological conservation, etc, etc. I gave this one a 7.5 out of 10, I believe, yes, just like Under the Skin. After that, I read two novellas. First, I read The Empress of Salt and Fortune, written by Nivo. And this was basically a little fantasy tale set in a fantasy world clearly strongly inspired by, I think specifically Chinese culture, folklore history, and it was fine. Basically, you follow this priest. I think the priest is non-binary, so I don't know how a priest, and we're gonna say priest, priest, priestess, who has a magical hoopoe. That's kind of cool, actually, a magical talking bird, and a bird you wouldn't, I guess, think of necessarily a hoopoe. It's a very colorful bird, and its magic has to do with 
remembering things and they keep them at the monastery this priest priestess comes from. And so this person is going to an old palace by a lake to basically record the history of the last empress of that territory because that empress was basically sent into exile, but then eventually founded a new dynasty, or I mean, through her children, founded a new dynasty that took over the country. So basically this priest priestess kind of functions as a historian archivist and they meet an old woman at this palace by the lake. She lives there. You kind of learn who this person is and she shares a lot of her story, which is tightly linked to the history of that territory country. I really did not get much out of this at all. It was interesting to get a fancy setting largely derived from, you know, major Asian culture. I think China in this case. I like the fact there was a magical hoopo, but I mean, beyond that? is fine. I, I don't know, I just didn't connect to this emotion at all. I mean, it's a novella, but you can do great things with novella. <laughs> Elder Ray's being a great example of that, but yeah, it just left me cold overall. That being said, I didn't hate it either, and I'd be open to reading the other novellas in this series. I believe it is a series, and there are two other novellas now in that series, so maybe I'll check them out at some point, because I, I did like the setting, I did like the magical bird, so we'll see. And it was written just five. I mean, I didn't pay that close attention to the pros, to be honest. So I gave it a 5.5 5 out of 10. It was just average. But like I said, I'm open to reading other things by this author, especially in this series of novellas. Then I read Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, written by Gail Honeyman. I've also done a full video review for this one if you're interested. And if you've seen it, you might recall I said I hoped I would be able to find a physical copy of this in London. I did! <laughs> I did. I bought this in London in a wonderful bookstore called Hatchards. Apparently it's one of the older bookstores in London. It dates to like the 18th century or something. Lovely. So I got, I got this there. This follows the story of Eleanor Oliphant, who, without spoiling anything, suffers from trauma. I think she can be read as autistic as well, very, very obviously, even though the author has stated that she didn't write her as being autistic, but I don't care. I read her as autistic, like Sumi. And I've talked about this main character as well in my recent Atypical and Autistic Coded Characters video, if you want to check that out. So it's Eleanor's story, and it deals with trauma, depression, mental health, friendship as well. There's a beautiful friendship in this book. It's lighthearted in places, quite funny, but it's also very dark and very emotionally impactful in others. And honestly, I consider this a new, not a new solid literary fiction favorite. I also cried at the end because... I read a lot of books recently-ish that made me cry by the end, so yes, and obviously I read it very strongly to themes of, well, to my mind, being autistic and trauma and depression and all those things. But, you know, generally speaking, I would strongly recommend this. Keep in mind those content warnings, obviously, but if you want a good story, around an interesting character going through some of the harsher human experiences, then uh, you could do worse than go with this one. And after that, or at the same time, I can't recall exactly, I read another novella called Nothing But Black and Teeth, written by Cassandra Kaur. I think that's how you pronounce it. To be perfectly honest here, this was a cover read. I mean, I was interested in this book primarily because I saw the cover. I think the cover is actually brilliant, like beautiful piece of horror illustration. <laughs> So basically, it's like a haunted house story set in Japan, so Japanese flavor of a haunted house story. If you know anything about the Japanese and that kind of stuff, they're absolutely brilliant at horror, whether it's in movies or video games. They tend to really nail that shit, like, yes, because <laughs> Japanese folklore is so fucking rich, like they've got a hundred different kinds of ghosts and stuff. So yes, you got a bunch of friends and one of them rented this Japanese mansion. So it's not just a house, it's a mansion because two of his friends are getting married. And so this group of friends, they have a thing for haunted places. And so he thought it would be cool, amusing to offer this experience to this couple who's about to get married and a couple of his other friends. The main character kind of is actually a woman. We used to date the man in question and she had some sort of mental illness episode. Kind of standard horror story tropes. And it was fine. I mean, I guess it was kind of enjoyable. I thought it was fairly well written actually overall. The author definitely managed to convey, you know, a creepy haunted mansion atmosphere, playing around with that Japanese folklore thing, yokai and things like that that show up in that mansion. And there's a ghost. <laughs> And bad things happen because they always do in horror stories, am I right? So if you want to check that out, 
It's not bad at all. It's not great by any means, but you could definitely do worse. I gave it a solid 6 out of 10, which is above average. So yeah, and I mean, again, that cover though. <laughs> I love that cover. So after that, I read On Chessel Beach written by Ian McEwan. So this is one of those books that my ex David said I might enjoy specifically because we'd had a conversation about my grandmother, my maternal grandmother. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a whole thing with that in my family. I personally believe she was autistic. I'm guessing that's where the autism genes come from, through the maternal line. And she was uh, a very mentally ill person. She was depressed most of her life. Anyway, but I told David that I'd been told by my mother that my grandmother on her wedding night was terrified of what was about to happen because she had no idea what sex was. She'd never seen a naked man, which was the case for a lot of women of that generation. So I talked about that. I mentioned the fact that my grandmother was a pianist. She should have been a professional pianist but that didn't happen because of the war and so yes that was probably her primary passion special interest what have you piano and opera and he said oh yeah there's this um novella written by Ian McEwan that deals with a couple on their wedding night and it goes very wrong and the woman is herself a musician so I was like okay so I kept that in mind and since I've decided to kind of go through all the books he recommended to me decided to read that one since it was fairly short also I have read an Ian McEwan novel before I've read Atonement I remember really loving it but I need to reread it so like I said, On Chessel Beach is basically a snapshot. It's not quite a snapshot, but it focuses in on this couple on their wedding night where things go very wrong. But then you also have chapters that give background information, context for the characters' personalities, what led them to meet one another, to get engaged married and it also touches upon you know the social mores of those years I guess it takes place what in the 60s something like that so the sexual revolution and changing customs around relationships sex dating etc this novella is very well written I mean Ian McEwan bloody knows how to write he really does know how to write and it was a beautifully written novella though there were a couple of times where I felt it it bordered just a teensy bit on self-indulgent, but otherwise it was a very smooth and agreeable reading experience because the prose was just, it was very good. <laughs> good descriptions, evocative, etc. There was decent characterization as well. Obviously it's literary fiction and the literary fiction I care about is character driven or should be character driven. So you do learn quite a bit about the main characters and the gist of it is, without spoiling much of anything, the woman Florence, I think, <laughs> I've already forgotten the names, I think she was called Florence, is not only scared of her wedding, it's not so much as, well, she's scared of her wedding night. It's not so much because she doesn't know what's going to happen, it's because she is strongly sex repulsed or sex averse. Basically, she's some kind of asexual, though there might be a specific reason for that. It's not terribly explicit in the text, but implicit enough that I picked up on it. I was like, that that's what I think it is, right? I won't spoil that. So it's more than just being scared of intimacy and dealing with sex with a man. She's really repulsed by the idea of sex and making love to her husband, even though she loves her husband, and the husband does not, you know, react terribly well, which is, to be fair, is understandable given her reaction. Overall, it was a good story. I gave it a solid 7 out of 10. Why not higher? Because for one thing, the denouement of this story felt a bit excessive to me and excessive in a way that I didn't find was properly set up. Something to me was missing in the characterization of the protagonists, just a missing link in the psychologies. I wasn't also super convinced that they loved each other that much. I mean they did, they were good friends, but what was there to really bind them to one another and I mean I can't spoil the ending but something happens to one of the characters throughout their life and I'm like should that really be the case, given this relationship doesn't seem to have been that intense or strong? So to me, there were gaps there. There were gaps in the storytelling and in the main character's psychology, which meant I didn't feel the ending was earned. I'm not going to say what kind of ending it is, but I just didn't think it was earned. So overall, a good reading experience, but it could have been better. I definitely think 
I prefer the tone, but like I said, I need to reread it. Still, I would recommend this if you're looking for a literary fiction novella looking at, well, human relationships, I guess, in this specific case, a romantic relationship, a couple of newlyweds, and how that can go very wrong. I should know, not in that specific manner, but yeah, so um, character psychology, that could have been done a bit better, but still, it's definitely worthwhile. Finally, in August, I read Hollow Kingdom by Kira Jane Buxton. I have a rave video review for this one if you're interested. Oh, I love this. A new kind of fancy magical realism but with an element of science fiction. <laughs> favorite. Not that long after Elder Race, a new science fiction favorite. So this year has been shite in many, many, many ways. But it's been actually pretty decent <laughs> in terms of what I've read and acquiring new favorites in a fair few different genres too. So this book follows a chroming character as he tries to figure things out after a plague hits humanity. And this plague basically transforms humans and particularly oozy <laughs> zombies. And this chromane character, ST, was raised by a human and is very attached to human beings and basically sees a lot of good in our species. And he wants to try and figure out if he can stop the plague or save humanity. And he's also accompanied by his erstwhile, well, I mean, his human is still alive, but a zombie is human's dog, Dennis. And yeah, they go out in Seattle and try to figure things out and they meet lots of different non-human animals along the way and it's just it's just a wonderful book i felt so many so many emotions reading this i got so much out of the theming there's strong theming around the environment environmental destruction but also the relationship between people between human beings and nature and other animals and relationships between animals and the cycle of life and death and mother nature or nature if you prefer and you know balance equilibrium all that good stuff that i tend to get a lot out of because it also touches on aspects of my personal faith plus the main character's a freaking crow and i'm a massive corvid lover my favorite groups of birds i love me some corvids <laughs> and i love st like just perfect crow character so I would very strongly recommend this one. If you're looking for that kind of theming I mentioned, if you want a very original story, if you want a non-human animal main character and lots of different non-human animal characters, I shed absolute rivers <laughs> when I finished this. This was straight up a 10 out of 10 for me. And as you can see, <laughs> I bought a physical copy. Unfortunately, I couldn't find it in hardback. In London, I decided to get it in hardback because I figured since I'm buying way less physical books these days, I can splurge and get, well, this isn't particularly fancy, but I can get at least just regular hardbacks for new favorites, which is what I did. And also I've bought book two. <laughs> I'm a bit worried because I love book one and I'm a bit scared of being disappointed with a second one, but still, I'm definitely going to read this. So I'm looking forward to that. Also, a quick note on the prose. It's very peculiar because it does mix high-flying vocabulary, lexical precision, and just beautiful evocative writing with more vulgar, raw, organic writing. It could very easily have flopped. Some people might find it a bit too grating, a bit too weird or dissonant. I thought it worked perfectly. I was surprised by that. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about picking, well, at least book one up. So yeah, and well, we'll see what I make of this one at some point in the future. Like I said, I won't have read that many books this month because it was a terrible month for my mental health. So I'll have, at best, read four books. <laughs> so I'll mention the first two. So I read a novel called Boy Parts, written by Eliza Clark. Complete spur of the moment read. I saw it featured on Goodreads via another Goodreads user I follow. We generally don't tend to have the same taste in books at all, but that one seemed intriguing when I read the synopsis. So this is the book's premise. You have this woman, Irina. She works at a bar, but she's also a semi-professional photographer. So she studied photography at pretty good art school in London. And she specializes in, broadly speaking, fetish photography, or at least photographing men, men who might not be classically beautiful, but that she finds attractive. She's also a bisexual character, so a bit of rep there, but she's mostly focused on men and she only photographs men. She kind of 
picks them up off the street, gives them her business card, etc. So she photographs them naked and then sometimes it goes into fetish stuff, erotic kinky stuff with costumes and kind of humiliating them and maybe punching them a bit. She also films herself doing this sometimes. And so the main narrative drive of this novel is that Arena receives an offer to have a very large part of her work exhibited at a a fairly upscale art gallery in London. So she thinks to herself this will be my big break because she doesn't entirely live off of her photography. She does have a very successful Instagram account. She's got this rich weird dude who gives her a shit ton of money for edgier photos, but she doesn't live off of her artwork. So this could open lots of doors for her. She could get a lot more recognition for her photography work, etc. And then she also meets a young man who works at a local Tesco and she's interested in this guy mostly to photograph him but there's a bit of a relationship that develops there and she has a best friend but you quickly realize this friendship is kind of not super healthy because this best friend is treated like shit by this arena and they also had a bit of a thing. So again this is a very psychology driven novel, again that's my preference when it comes to lit fiction. I guess this also kind of qualifies as a psychological thriller, kind of. So I definitely found the unusual psychology of the main character interesting. It also portrays a world I will never be a part of, thankfully, but you know that bourgeois contemporary art world where there's a lot of weird shit and a lot of drugs circulating. I'm sorry, it kind of sounds ridiculous, but if you know what I mean, you'll know what I mean. That kind of sphere of people and there, there are a shit ton of drugs circulating. Like I'm not at all against drugs for adults but I was like y'all need to calm down with the shit because <laughs> I was like whoa so yeah I got a window into that world I got a window into Arena's interesting psychology now the hook for this book is also that there is a bit of commentary around objectification consent so sexual consent I mean objectification of women through the lens of of a female character objectifying male models. It's the kind of theming where you approach the theme by its reverse, by its complete opposite. I kind of like that. I thought that was clever or at least, you know, different, interesting, original. I'm sure it's been done before, but interesting formula. I guess you're definitely invited to think about those things because Arena herself has skeletons in her closet and so she, she basically likes to have this power over these men. Like, there's a bit of kinky stuff involved. I also wanted to add that, so Arena has this whole thing about photographing male models, and you do have this commentary, like I said, but there is also, without hopefully spoiling much of anything, there is a bit of a potentially descent into madness motif to this book, and I have seen some reviewers compare it to Bret Easton Ellis's American Psycho. Now, I've never read the book, I've only seen the movie adaptation with Christian Bale, and I liked it well enough. I can't comment further on the parallels to the actual novel, but so there is a bit of that going on and that also provides narrative tension and drive and intertwines more generally well with the theming and the main character's character arc. So there is a bit of that if you find that stuff interesting and or alluring in your fiction. I gave it a solid 6.5 out of 10, so yeah definitely above average. The writing is very contemporary, it does allude to a lot of hallmarks of millennial culture maybe because the main character is about my age. This might put off some readers or be very attractive to other readers. I will say this though, there's a lot of dark humour. I like that. <laughs> British dark humour and I did laugh out loud several times reading this thing at some of Arena's comments on men and relationships. I was like, okay, that, that, <laughs> that's very funny. Very dark, but very funny. So if you like dark humor, this is also in this novel. So yeah, decent psychological thriller, literary psychological thriller. If you want to read about a um, fucked up woman <laughs> and get some commentary about that stuff at the same time, go for this one. So yeah, I'm definitely happy I read it. It was different from the stuff I usually read. And so the second book I read finished in September, was Orsinia, written by Ursula K. Le Guin. <laughs> I have finally read all of Ursula K. Le Guin's fiction. I am proud about that? I don't know if it's pride, but I actually did it. I think. I think I've read all of her fiction. I'm pretty sure I have read all of her fiction work. So this volume contains a full-length novel, Malafrena or The Necessary Passion, and a bunch of short stories set in a fictional country. 
Orsinia. Supposed to be somewhere in Eastern Europe. So, I don't know, kind of by Austria, the Czech Republic, that general area. So this collection of works is speculative in the sense it'll take place in a fictional country, but otherwise it's basically literary fiction or literary fake historical fiction, if you see what I mean. Because the full-length novel, Malafrena, basically takes place in the 19th century. It takes a look at the principle of revolution, because the time period in which this novel happens corresponds to a time period during which there were a lot of revolutionary movements across Europe. So that's kind of one of the main themes of the book. Freedom, revolution, changing your country's fate and structure and everything. It centers on a family that comes from a specific region of Orsinia, which is, wait, is it Malafrena or is that the river? <laughs> or was that? I can't remember. But they come from a mountainous region. So you follow the firstborn son, you follow his sister, and they're like a couple of related families you follow. And it read like a 19th century novel. I think that was her intent, actually, because there is an introduction by Sir K. Le Guin in this book, and she said she wanted to write a European novel that... Apparently she preferred getting her inspiration from European writers instead of American ones. I did not know that. It was interesting. And so she wanted to emulate that European literature and create something that would fit into that canon, sort of. And yeah, I mean, I was mildly reminded of some older novels I've read, classics, whether English language classics or French language classics written in the 19th century. The prose itself reads as contemporary, but it's good prose because it's us like freaking Kayla Gwynn. But I did get those vibes of like, this is the 19th century, this is how relationships function, this is what people cared about in that time period. Also, you know, this motif of revolution and alluding to other revolutions in other European countries, which is largely why it didn't really work for me. Okay, no, it's not that it didn't work for me, I was just not that taken in by it. I rated this overall an 8 out of 10 because it's us like Kayla Gwynn. I mean, it is well written. It is interesting. And there are good stories, besides the full-length novel, in this particular volume. But on a purely personal enjoyment basis, this was more of a seven. Because it features a type of story I usually don't really care about. It's not the kind of story I like within the genre of literary fiction. Because I've had very bad experiences with 19th century literature, especially with the French. Not so much the English, but still. I always get a sense of coziness and comfort when I read something by Ursula K. Le Guin when I encounter her prose. So I did get that here, and I really enjoy that, especially because it's not been a good month at all. But also because it hasn't been a good month mental health-wise, I had a hard time staying focused on this. So it's not so much that I was bored, but I had a hard time staying focused on this. I went a couple of days without reading and wasn't that enthusiastic about picking it back up. So yeah, I think the short stories work better for me overall. I really enjoyed a few of them and they all basically take place during different time periods, still within the country of Orsinia, but so you have a story set in the Middle Ages, another one in like the 1800s, then 1920s, the 1960s, etc, etc. And some of those were really good. I mean, again, it says like Kayla Gwynn and she can do short stories very well. So so I guess averaged out, it's more of a 7.5 out of 10. But <laughs> I rounded it up to a... Well, no, I didn't round it up to an 8. I rounded it up to four stars on Goodreads. So yes, it's... It is technically a 7.5, which is very good, but I prefer her speculative fiction. Like, there's nothing for it. Would I recommend this? I mean, yes, it is well written. There are good stories in here. Even the novel, Malafrena, is a decent novel if you want that kind of ambiance, those kinds of references to older literature, to European literature from the 19th century, etc. So if you're looking for that from a more well, contemporary, you know what I mean, perspective, yes, <laughs> go for this one. Also, it's kind of cool that she created a fictional country and it, it feels real because she's a good writer. So it does feel real. So definitely points for that. She achieved what she set out to do basically with this. It's not personally my thing, but she achieved what she wanted to do. She created a, a rich tapestry of culture and history within the stories taking place in Orsinia. Y'all ready for a book haul? Because it's, it's a pretty decent one too. <laughs> So, like I said, from the 1st to the 5th of September, I went to the UK with my mother. We spent two nights in London and two nights in Swindon. That's in Wiltshire. My English family comes from Wiltshire, the West Country. Most of them are around Swindon, or this little town now called Wharton. There. You might not be interested, but I told you anyway. <laughs> and so the main reason we decided to go to London 
when we did, besides visiting family, obviously, my great one specifically, is because there was a really awesome exhibit at the British Museum about femi- is it called feminine power from the demonic to the divine? I think that's what it's called. About basically, yeah, the, the divine feminine or the demonic feminine. So looking at different goddesses and female archetypes throughout different cultures and different time periods with commentary from different women who hold positions of power and linking it also to feminist theory a little bit. It was a relatively small exhibit, but I think it was actually the perfect format. It was small, but so to the point and well done with the things they were exhibiting. I thought it was perfect. It was It's just a lovely, brilliant exhibit. <laughs> there were a lot of women there with their daughters, but a few men as well. So yeah, it was a great experience. And of course, being the mythology nerd, I was like... <laughs> With my mother, come here, I'm going to explain what this is to you. So I provided all the commentary for my mother, but she likes it, so, you know. There was an awesome looking sword, a sacrificial sword that was used uh, in rituals dedicated to the goddess Kali. I was like, I could see that in Elden Ring. <laughs> and you also had this big stone figure of a, or some kind of Mesoamerican goddess that looked kind of creepy. I actually have a postcard of it, so that's what it looked like. <laughs> I just thought it was funny that it went, whoop. <laughs> like this. And there were also these beautiful artistic devotional creations dedicated to the Virgin Mary, who is, well, Christianity's version of the Divine Feminine, and Guan Yin, an Asian bodhisattva which incarnates compassion for others. I'm not gonna go to the mythology lesson here, but yeah, it was a brilliant exhibit. Of course, being in London, I wanted to go to bookstores. I was like, this is non-negotiable. I need to go to the big ass Waterstones off of Piccadilly Circus because it's like five levels on it. Though we also went to this other bookstore I mentioned, Hatchards, a very old one. It was really lovely. I was like, why can't I have that in Brussels? <laughs> and then we also went to this amazing <laughs> bookstore called Forbidden Planet Nerdvana. That, that's what it was. It was basically dedicated to comic book stuff, science fiction, fantasy, nerd culture. And I was like, uh, why can't I have this in Brussels? We walked a lot. I, my poor mother, she was very brave accompanying me to all these bookstores. We also went to the Natural History Museum and I got a few books from there because I always go into museum gift shops, like, please, of course I do. So we went to the Natural History Museum. It's one of my favorite buildings in London. I just adore that building. And we went to see Dippy because Dippy was back at the museum for a while, but Dippy's gonna go away again on a tour of the UK. So I, I saw Dippy, I took a picture of Dippy. If you don't know, Dippy's a beautiful skeleton of a Diplodocus that used to be in the entrance hall of the Natural History Museum. And we also took a picture of um, Sir Charles Darwin, because of course. And then the last day we went to London, we went to the British Library, which we'd never been to before. And it was great because they have this permanent exhibit about, well, books, <laughs> the history of making books, books about different things. We had all these old manuscripts about religion, about science, and they also have the Magna Carta is there. If you're interested, you can go see it at the British Library. So that was very neat, and I also <laughs> got a book from there. So let's get to the books. So from the Natural History Museum, I got this, rather, <laughs> my mother got it for me, <laughs> because she's awesome. So 50 plus, that changed the course of history. I have already read this book. So the story with this one is that my mother brought back a paperback copy of this from New York. So she bought it at the Natural History Museum in New York when she went there a few years ago now. And I really enjoyed that book. And then I lent it to my half-brother who lives in the States and he loves everything that has to do with food and the history of food. And this does touch upon, well, culinary plants as well. And I never got the book back. <laughs> So my mom was like, okay, I'll get it for you again and upgrade it too, because it's a nice, it's a good hardback book. It's quite pretty actually, because it's like this on the inside. So it's a book about plants that <laughs> change the course of human history, quite simply. And it's quite good. I tend to like books like these, you know, that feature different bits of history around, well, in this case, botany, but yes. So got this. Now at Waterstones, I was actually quite sad because I was looking for a few different books specifically and didn't really find any of them. So I was like, are you for freaking real? I consoled myself by getting this, The Magic of Mushrooms. So this apparently is a Kew Gardens press publication, but I found it at Waterstones and it looks very interesting and pretty inside. It's a book about mushrooms. I like me some mushrooms, so I'm all for mycology, so yay. <laughs> And not just magic mushrooms, because I've read quite a bit about magic mushrooms, but um, this is mushrooms in general, so looking forward to delving into that one. And then I also got this little feminist essay. I think I'd heard of it before. I was like, eh, why not? It's, it's not that long. 
So when I have a moment, I'll just read this short essay about consent and stuff and sexual relationships between men and women from a feminist point of view, kind of. I mean, we'll see what I make of it ultimately, but so yes, I got this. Then at the British Museum, I kind of went nuts in the little gift shop they specifically set up for the exhibit. We got this for the household, really, but we got a book for the exhibit. So it was, yeah, Feminine Power from the Divine to the Demonic. And it basically lists all of the items you could see in the exhibit and also just other things and commentary. So I'll probably dip into this at some point. And then I got this, an illustrated book about goddesses, spirit saints, because, you know, it was thematically linked. I think this is meant for younger audiences. But I kind of love these kinds of books. I'm a mythology nerd and I never tire even of rereading mythological content I'm already familiar with. But I mean, I don't know, it looks kind of nice with the illustrations and stuff. I love these kinds of books that just work as compendiums of yeah, goddesses and mythology and all that good stuff. So I'll have fun with this. On the more adult and serious pondering side, I got this. Queens of the Wild, Pagan Goddesses in Christian Europe, an investigation written by Ronald Hutton. Now, I have another <laughs> Ronald Hutton book waiting on my physical TBR called The Witch. But it's like his domain of expertise. He does research about paganism, neo-paganism, all that stuff. And I really liked his book, The Triumph of the Moon. So I'm sure I'll enjoy this and the other book I already have. I was like, but it looks pretty. Um, yeah, I'm getting it. <laughs> I told you, I was like, take my money. <laughs> And I got this as well, The Celtic Myths. Now, there were other books in this, it was like a collection. There was one for Norse myths, Japanese, Greek, no, Egyptian. I was like, oh, I want to buy all of them though. I was like, no, no, you will be reasonable here. You get one. So preference went to Celtic mythology, but um, if this is good enough, y'all can imagine I'm probably going to get the other ones in this collection. Then at this Nerdvana SFS specific bookstore, Forbidden Planet, I got one book. I was tempted to get some of the graphic novels they had on display and art books. I was like, uh -huh, but they're expensive. <laughs> so I only got one thing. I got Dawn, written by Octavia E. Butler. So this is the first book in her Xenogenesis trilogy. I hadn't specifically planned on reading it this year in any case, and I might not get to this this year, but I somewhat had decided I would eventually get to it because I loved Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents. Kindred was a bit more meh for me, but it was still decently good. But so I, I did want to check out some of her other science fiction because she is one of the greats as well. And so I've heard mostly about the Xeno Genesis trilogy. I know she had another one, the Pattern Maker trilogy or something, but I might as well go with this one first because it's actually a fairly short trilogy. I mean, each volume in the trilogy is fairly short. These books are not that chunky. So, I mean, together, I think they're not even 900 pages. It's like about 300 pages apart. And also this cover, because a lot of her books have been republished recently-ish with these very colorful and beautiful covers. And I'm like, Yes. So I will read this one and presumably get the other two in the same edition because they are very pretty. So I went to Waterstones, I went to Forbidden Planet, and I went to this lovely bookstore called Hatchards, which I'd never heard of before. Like how? How had I never heard of this? <laughs> Didn't really find anything speculative fiction-wise. I did find my physical copy of Eleanor Oliphant. It's completely fine. That's where I bought it. And then I was like, because I'd seen them on display at Waterstones. They were on display at Hatchards. And I was like, ah. Oh, Fuck's sake. So, um, I got these. <laughs> Why? I really don't, because they're pretty covers. I don't freaking know. Honestly, I'm pretty certain they're very different kinds of stories from normal people because I cannot go through that again anytime soon. I was like, oh, well, I might as well check out her other two novels, see what I make of them. <laughs> and yeah, pretty covers and matching sets of covers. I don't... Yeah, I bought them. <laughs> That's all I can say about that. So I will read Sally Rooney's other two novels at some point. And then at the British Library, I've got one final thing. I got this, the Penguin Book of Dragons. And so this is a Penguin Classics anthology of stories featuring dragons from different cultures and different time periods. And yeah, because dragons, and I like anthologies. Well, I mean, I like thematic anthologies. In fact, it's funny because this is the Penguin Book of Dragons. I have the Book of Dragons, right? Well, you can see it on my shelf there. And that was a really good anthology. I was really surprised by that, but it's contemporary fiction. And this is different works of cla older fiction, really. I don't know that they're classics, but from different cultures, like I said, and different time periods. I'll go through this relatively quickly at some point once again, but so dragons.
Yay! So the other two books I will probably finish by the end of the month are The Secret History, written by Donna Tartt, and Gender Critical Feminism, written by Holly Lawford-Smith, maybe, because this not... No bueno. Also, I've been really well, busy doing my deep dives for Rings of Power. Takes a lot of time, actually. And also it's tiring because that show is so not good. <laughs> but still, it's kind of fun doing it. So, but yeah, it, it takes a big chunk of my time and limited energy, which is why I didn't do this wrap-up sooner. So, there you have it. So, per usual, if you want to share thoughts, comments about any of the books I talked about, mentioned, showed from the book haul, you're more than welcome to in the comments down below or on the Discord server. I tried to update the link with each video because I know they expire after seven days. But uh, in the meantime, I hope you'll have a lovely day, evening, whichever time of day you prefer. Do take good care of yourselves. Better care than I do myself because I'm, I'm shit at self-care. So please do take good care of yourselves, even if I can't. Thank you for the continued support. And I shall see you all again, probably in another Rings of Power deep dive. But until then, bye-bye.